You'll see it show. Uh, yeah, live All on right. YouTube. There you go. I'm live. Great. Okay. So um, uh, to a, uh, a massive audience of three, let me just uh, let me just give the uh, the overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm I'm talking here from the the Content Delivery and Security Organization, which is association, which is a um, vendors in the in the in the media supply chain. So what I'm working on at the moment is a a, a set of contr a control framework for uh, media and entertainment distribution. Um, so this is for movies and TV uh, getting from the content studios to the the customer. Uh, and everyone is an expert in media because everyone consumes it. And really about five years ago, there was an initiative called Trusted Partner Network. And this was trying to address an issue in the supply chain, which was every vendor was being asked for a separate security audit from every studio. So you'd end up bearing the cost of six separate audits and not just the cost of doing the audit, but also the, the time taken to, to kind of fill in questionnaires, answer questions. And if anyone's been through that process, it's quite, um, it's quite tough. So really kicked off by a guy called Ben Stanbury at Disney. There was this concept of having a common control set and then uh, basically uh, making up, uh, setting up an operation that meant that studios could share the audit reports from a, against these common set of controls and that the vendors would only have to do one annual audit, uh, really to try and uh, address this, um, this friction in the supply chain. Now that was quite successful uh, and very well adopted, but uh, obviously what's happened in recent years is the audience and the revenues are both moving uh, to the cloud. So we've seen the growth of uh, things like Netflix, Amazon Prime, and the studios responding with HBO Go, um, Hulu, and with Disney Plus. Um, and what we what probably isn't apparent to most people is that there's been similarly there's been a, a digital revolution um, on the back end of production. So by and large, what was a largely a, a film-based process has shifted to the same digital cameras. So whether you're looking at a film or a TV program or an advert, they're all gonna be shot on the same 8K ARRI or RED um, uh, back. And you've got these very large digital files being uh, produced and distributed. I think alongside that though, there's also been a, um, a shift to the cloud. And what's interesting is the, the original uh, TPN best practice, the original MPA best practice guidelines, which was the basis of the audit, um, really didn't encompass uh, a lot of the cloud concepts. So we've got cloud companies coming to the fore, but not, uh, but, uh, and looking to get, if you like, uh, assured under this, this, this process to reassure vendor, that their, their studio customers that they've got, um, that they've got this, uh, uh, they've been through the audit process, but it's not really there. And the way I look at uh, the way I look at the um, uh, the supply chain is is that there's a range of skills across this. Now we're in media and entertainment; it's not a regulated industry, so you start from a very low base with something like Cyber Essentials, and then on the far right hand side, you've got uh, regulatory regimes where if you get it wrong, you go to prison, which is a big incentive for people to comply. And although media entertainment is not in a regulated space at the moment, um, as I said, as, as studios start to, uh, to, 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 um, to, to move forward and look at um, uh, direct to consumer, then you start getting into GDPR and CCPA issues. So this is, this is really what's changing. You can start with a very low base with Cyber Essentials. Um, in the UK, there's a thing called DPP, uh, the Digital Production Partnership, and they have a self-certified checklist. And that's, a, again, a very good basis, but it's only 43 controls compared to some 300 controls on the TPN audit. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's also self-certified. So although they have some uh, sampling, there isn't the, the kind of direct audit being done by an accredited auditor to make sure that's, that's correct. So you can see this evolution from basic hygiene through um, kind of self-certification um, through to uh, this full professional audit, um, annual audit. And then at the far right-hand side, you've got people like Netflix who are you know, doing, establishing things like zero trust, where they're really starting to, to build, uh, build security inside the organization, not just at the perimeter. So, um, when, I, when you go through the MPA controls and you can go and look at the MPA best practice um, and you'll find this, this um, 100 page PDF document. And this is typical 
of a lot of the security controls. They're very dense jargon, um, and uh, it's very difficult to get 100 pages of PDF uh, with uh, dense tables on um, stuck in your brain. So the way I, I look at it is that you can, you can consider this as blocks. There's always going to be people and operational processes involved. If you go into the traditional physical, you know, film processing or DVD replication, there'll be a, a fence around the building. There'll be security guards patrolling. Um, you'll have a reception area where people, guests will come and then maybe they'll get let into the back office. And content is very much stripped out and kept separate with a content loading dock and then the in-house content production. And there's a lot of controls around making sure that you don't get blank, um, blank disks aren't available, that no one can transfer things in and out, you do body searches. There's a whole ton of stuff to make sure that um, uh, content is secured in that physical facility. There's a digital aspect to this as well. And um, if you look at that digital aspect, you can map those same blocks to um, the firewall being equivalent to the perimeter. And then a switch routes you into your, your DMZ for your content production network, your dropper point, or to the, the guest Wi-Fi and the mobile, which would be the least secure, and then the office network which should be more closed. And when you switch that into the cloud, what you get is a, uh, a, a lot of that uh, fabric, a lot of that infrastructure is abstracted up into uh, someone else's infrastructure. And it's then sitting in a, a US uh, West data center somewhere. Um, but you will always have the people running the business and you will always have some sort of location. Even in COVID days, that might just be a, a bunch of home offices, but you've still got some vulnerabilities that you need to protect against. But the other thing you get when you move to cloud is um, cloud is very flexible, um, but it also is dependent entirely on your software release. So uh, this is something, a concept that may be alien to a lot of the old vendors in that supply chain. So going back about three years, uh, there, it was recognized something had to be done about application and the cloud. And so it was originally thought of as uh, you have apps and you have cloud platforms. And if anyone here has visited a, a cloud data center, they're inherently incredibly physically secure. You have not much signage, remote locations. Um, uh, you have security guards, armed guards. You have airlocks. So to actually get into one of those buildings is pretty tough. Um, but that building is all that's doing is housing the service. What we're, what we're talking about here doesn't really address what happens on top of that cloud platform. Um, and then the application uh, in of itself, um, what you tend to find that applications, software as a service applications tend to be built by quite small organizations. Um, so maybe you'd be lucky to get 10, 20, 30 devs on an application. But the issue is that one application doesn't really cover the full gamut of what you need for a media supply chain. You're gonna end up with multiple applications. Those applications will be integrated with integration code, either written in-house or by an external systems integrator. And then you have the infrastructure as code, your, your Terraform, the thing that stands up and, and runs and manages your cloud platform. And so this is a new attack surface, which is a lot more complex that you have multiple applications, small vendors um, that you need to make sure their, their, their code release is secure. You've got integration, and this may be a systems integration partner dropping in and leaving, or it might be uh, in-house expertise that might be less uh, less experts, really, less expert than than uh, than an application vendor. And then finally, you've got to uh, check that your configuration is being kept up to date. And the way that the really big companies do this, uh, the way they manage this is uh, incredibly complex. So if you look at um, someone like Amazon, there's a great presentation here, which Andy Troutman gave at uh, reInvent two years ago. And he was talking about uh, how Amazon do development. So they have uh, the, the classic two pizza team where they, are, um, they have uh, pretty well autonomy at that low level. They can choose what tools they like. They can choose the, you know, the framework and the environment they're doing. But at the point they want to release this and actually push it out uh, to live, they have to get through this release pipeline. And this pipeline uh, check that I put at the bottom here, when Andy showed this at, at um, uh, reInvent, it scrolled to the right about seven screens. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of control. Um, Amazon regard every change to their, their uh, systems as being something that's an, uh, an antagonistic uh, attempt to bring down Jeff Bezos' empire. 
here's a picture of Netflix, and this is um, back in 2014. So this is a, uh, you know, obviously it's got a lot worse since then. This is a microservices architecture. But with this level of complexity, you've got a pretty sophisticated security culture to make sure you don't get breaches. And there are only a few players, you know, at this level, you know, a Google, a Microsoft, um, who are doing this sort of complex software management, who are very, have very mature processes and are very sophisticated. So when you shift to the cloud, it's all about software. Um, but I think the other things it's worth also saying, what else is driving that shift to the cloud and that massive growth uh, across all the platforms? And I think a lot of it is around the economics. Um, uh, and especially if you look at something like media and entertainment, the, the workloads are very variable. So if you're shooting a new production, a $300 million movie, you'll spin up hundreds of people and you'll spin them down again. And that's over a short period. So although in the, uh, the distribution side of the business, you may have some stability, really there's a, a lot of shift of a lot of variability. So this shift here from CapEx to OpEx is very important. I think it's also uh, clear to say that the, the old model uh, of a lot of the, the tools in this supply chain was on a seven year ref refresh cycle, you go and uh, go to an RFP process, you buy your, your application and then you implement it. It took a long time, a very much a waterfall type approach. And what's now changing is you can rent these services on a cloud basis based on usage. And I think that um, again, a shift from massive CapEx to OpEx uh, is uh, is driving the, the change. The second thing is that the, the cloud, there's always been a great deal of skepticism about putting content uh, workflows, co content workflows into the cloud. And that's really been around the fact that people consider uh, that they have to move things in and out of the cloud, that every time you egress content, there's a cost and, uh, and that there's a latency as well in terms of moving stuff up and down across the network. But I think there's a new approach being taken, which is that you move the tools and the skills to the work. So until race recently, it hasn't been practical to be able to say, we'll run the, we'll leave the assets in the cloud, but we're now at a position where you can put the content into S3 or into Azure, and then you can have your, your tools that do the creative work right alongside um, the, uh, the, the, the heavy data. And you can abstract that with the VDI interface with a remote workstation running across um, uh, across the internet. The other, the other change I think that people should appreciate about the shift to cloud is the frequency of audit. Because in the past, when you're building an edit suite, you know, a post-production facility, you could build your edit suite, you have a lock on the door, you have cameras outside. Inside the room, you have a big workstation, you have some nice screens and five on audio, a leather couch for the clients to sit on. Really nothing much changes in the edit suite over you know, one, two, three, four, five years. But when you get to the cloud, um, every time you do a release, every change, you know, one comma in your JSON can change your approach. So the frequency of audit needs to be much, uh, um, uh, much quicker. There needs to be a lot more uh, audit going on. So this App and Cloud Initiative was basically tried to extend that original MPA program to cover the new use cases and, and to create a custom control set. And if you look in the supply chain, you've got a range of business sizes and types. So Walt Disney has something like 3,000 um, different uh, vendors in their supply chain. Some like NBCU, maybe 1,600. Um, BBC Studios, about five, 600. And if, you know, across that supply chain, if you have a, uh, you know, you're really dependent on the weakest link. So you know, the recent breach that um, happened with um, HBO, uh, with Game of Thrones, it was uh, someone sitting in an edit suite in, in India and someone filming it, uh, their girlfriend filming it on a camera. So it doesn't take, uh, this is, this, it doesn't take a great deal of technology. It just is a, you know, the, the social practice that can expose you. So you've got to make sure you have a, a security culture that's established right from the very top. Walt Disney have got 40,000 people in media and entertainment, and probably there's probably 40 people, uh, core security specialists. So it's one in a thousand. If you look across the supply chain, most of the companies would be less than 100 people. So you're going to have, you know, one or less people really focus on security if you're lucky. So you've got to make sure that security controls, which is a quite an esoteric subject, uh, is really taken up by the whole of the business. So, um, I launched into this, I, I took on 600 custom controls and uh, tried to wrestle them to the ground. And one thing you can be sure of is 
if you have 10 security controls experts in a room, you're going to end up with 11 opinions. And it was a, a pretty brutal process of trying to edit and manage and map 600 uh, customized security controls. So around Christmas uh, last year, I had a bit of an epiphany that said, let's, uh, let's take the mappings that we've got with each of these controls mapping down to reference standards like ISO and NIST and COVID. And if you flip the, the, flip the controls around, you map from those controls, you found that there were great holes in the mapping and people have just really run out of the, um, the will to live. They, they, they lost it. Uh, they lost so much time writing these controls, the mapping was incomplete. So by mapping controls from the industry standards, you can get away from having to maintain custom controls. It takes a huge amount of effort away from it. And also, if you can automate the updates, it means you're, you're always got an update set of controls. You re reduce that, um, that volunteer effort to maintain them. The second thing is that if we look at those controls, you'll find that many of them are incredibly granular level of detail. And although that's necessary for the auditor to be able to do the checks, and it's necessary for the whoever's doing the implementation to get the, the, the guide, it's a level of detail that, that really means you lose the, the shape of the control framework um, within those controls. And it's, it becomes very specialist and only read by a uh, very small audience. So if you can leverage those cloud platforms, um, best practice and design patterns, if you can move some of the more detailed implementation controls into that space, you end up with a, uh, a reduced set of controls um, and you have a, 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 something that's much more approachable for normal mortals not security controls experts. So this is the other key, which is how do you give that set of documentation across? So again, I don't know um, of the people on the call, how many people have read security control frameworks. And I spent the last four months, you know, with a, living in a spreadsheet of about uh, two and a half thousand lines. But if you, uh, it's not something that most people can approach or get a sense of, of what is proper. So delivering that not in a hundred page PDF, but in a, um, a structure that's easily mappable against things that all businesses have to have. So every business has to have a plan and they have to have written HR policies. They have to have business continuity. If they're writing software, they have to have a design guide. They have to track the business meetings to show that there's engagement by the management in the, in the security uh, of, of uh, customers' content. They have to track incidents and, and bugs. If something goes wrong, they need to stand up a response team. So uh, most businesses have that, it may be on paper, it may be in a SharePoint, it may be in a JIRA database, but giving people a set of content that's easily applied. The second thing is addressing that frequency of audit because you can no longer afford to have an expert auditor sitting in uh, your shop, looking at what you're doing for the, for, the, for the whole year. A lot of businesses, you know, driven by sales, uh, and again, I'm being a bit cynical here, driven by sales will, uh, approach an audit, get the tick list, then sell for the next year without really applying any of the principles that they went through in the audit, and then scurry around trying to pick that up again. So you really want to make sure that you can provide a dynamic dashboard where the tracking and the checks that an auditor would normally look at uh, are brought up, um, brought up as soon as um, you know, a, 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 you know, basically uh, are brought up as soon as a, uh, a, a an error occurs. But you really want to give the businesses, the tools themselves. And finally, you've got to help develop those new skills to build that security culture. Because if you try and find people who've got media workflow experience, understand uh, agile software development, um, understand the business value of some of these things, uh, understand audit, you are really uh, got a very small set of people. We know there's a massive shortage of cybersecurity experts generally. And then if you try and layer on top of that with uh, media security, you're hunting for unicorns. So where have we got to? Well, um, across uh, the technology committee, you know, some 48 strong, there's been a lot of bottom-up mapping to try and break those controls down and uh, uh, try and uh, uh, remove some of the duplication. And that got to a certain point to get people familiar with it. Um, but really to, to move it forward, I've also done a top-down set of mapping where you have a reduced set of say 50 controls that's with a basic narrative that is something that is in business language that people can understand. I've spoken with the standards groups, people like OWASP to say, can we get your, any changes to that control documentation in a machine readable format, something like a YAML that you can then apply to your control sets. And the major cloud platforms are obviously all very keen to participate in media and entertainment. And so 
they have um, a great deal of kind of well architected type um, solution mapping best best practice uh, secure config guidelines and they have tooling which they can provide that then leads to the next effort which is go back and take out from that reduce set i've got it down from all you know collectively we've got it down from two and a half thousand to say 1400 controls to reduce that with either saying that these controls are equivalent so you can map them out um, or moving really detailed controls into those implementation guides provided by the cloud platforms and then finally pub publishing a you know like a reference model documentation set uh, to so that people can can pick it uh, pick up and start adopting this early because it's gonna be a while before those detailed controls are necessarily all in place but it means you can make the start there's a thing called the ISAC, which is uh, publishing the regular threats, and uh, it's making sure that that uh, you can automate that um, those threats models into a risk register. And finally, you, you can you have a way of, of checking uh, that uh, uh, the assessment and providing a, an external way of looking at what's going on. So back to the studios originally looking for those those uh, shared reference points, be able to check on on how people are running security. So this is the top down mapping, uh, apologies for the eye strain chart, but you can see here that what we have is a, uh, I've separated it into a number of different zones. So you, the reference uh, control sets here are ISO 27002 and 1 and 17. Um, there's the CCM 301, which is a cloud security alliance checklist. And then you've got the Center for Internet Security, their kind of infrastructure mapping. Um, plus OWASP ASVS. And by taking those fundamental controls, you find you can start to cluster equivalent. So uh, CCM is very strong on the people and process side and on um, uh, the uh, how you do audit for that shared re responsibility, but it's pretty weak on um, application development, only four controls. ISO 27002 is a great kind of overview, but it really isn't a level of detail that allows you to, to really be cloud specific. CIS is great for infrastructure, so it kind of covers the um, uh, the hybrid and the on-prem scenarios. But there, you know, th there's still quite a degree of overlap between that and CCM. Uh, and then OASP is is very detailed. That the uh, the ASVS uh, four is is very detailed on your verification of, of practical visas, but probably at a bit more of a granular level than most people need. So by bringing this together and saying look, there are different audiences here. There's an exec audience and they're gonna really want to deal with the people uh, processes. Uh, they're gonna want to deal with the supply chain, third party commercial agreements, making sure the SLAs are in place. They're gonna look at their policy and governance and also the risk register. That's really what would concern an exec team. And if you can reduce that down to say 10, 15 controls, um, map down to the more detailed ones, but once they can approach, they can start to apply this on their internal documentation systems and work out what's left to do. For operational people, you've got the uh, roles and responsibilities, which uh, really predominantly is around access control. There's data, which in this instance is the actual media assets themselves. And then you've got physical locations, whether you're a big company like a Technicolor with sites around the world or just a, a, you know, a small cloud software and service provider. You've got the development lifecycle, which really underpins all of this, because even if you're doing infrastructure, you're, you're hopefully using infrastructure as code to do that publishing. And then within here, there's a bunch of stuff, which is conventional kind of network checks and crypto and so on. Um, and it's, uh, there's still some more work to disentangling this. But what you end up with here is a, um, is a, a structure, and apologies that, that that block on the right shouldn't be there, but you start off by saying, uh, the first thing we're going to address is the the version control. We're gonna we're gonna make sure that we the first thing you address is your your security controls. We're gonna take these different areas that we're mapping to, and we're gonna uh, create a uh, a set of five pillars: site security, people and process, cloud platform, infrastructure management, and development lifecycle. And by mapping all the these uh, external controls once into these control set, then you reduce your amount of maintenance you're trying to do. The second thing you need to do is to go to the cloud platforms and pull through um, their collateral. So the secure config guidelines are well architected. Uh, create a toolbox, something like a, a, a specific tool, like a Prowler for AWS, uh, to be able to give people the, the, the detailed information they need to, to actually put good, good security practice in a, into effect. 
you need to defer, define your your process, your um, uh, what your your this documentation set. And the first thing an auditor will always do when they visit a site is to start to say, show me your operations guide, show me your meeting notices, you know, show me your processes and policies. And if you find any cracks, you start hammering a wedge in. So having a uh, a wiki type uh, a single set of electronic documentation means you're you're bang up to date. So just to be clear, there are standards. There are a set of controls which are mapped through and then what you'll need to do is take those controls and write a set of procedures and the idea here is to create a um uh, a starting point that enables you to very quickly write those those uh, procedures there are updates that need to take place so we'll, we'll have um, both updates to the controls that we'll map through uh, using that yaml approach as i suggested but also the threat model coming from the isac will need to update your risk register there's the people training. At the end of the day, this is about the security culture and working out whether people are cloud certified, what's left to do, have they read the documents, all that sort of uh, that tracking of the individuals. And finally, um, uh, audit, which is what's the audit process? How do you, how do you um, uh, make sure that auditors have enough information to read? How do you make it public without disclosing to competitors? How can a, a studio looking at making a choice of vendors discriminate between different, um, different players here? And if you take something like um, OWASP, you can see OWASP ASVS plays very much in this control space. But something like SAM, the maturity model, is very much um, something you'd expect that kind of uh, a good practice to say where, you know, where is your development uh, at? What do you need to do to go up that maturity curve? So there's a detailed control set, uh, and that um, hopefully is a one-time exercise. To, once you've done that mapping, then all you need to keep is those mapping, those mapping controls. So I guess in conclusion as to where I've got to with this, you know, we go back to the original, uh, the, the original intent. So was to improve the content security in the studio supply chain. And this is now being extended, the control set's been extended to include the cloud. And the cloud's already here. There are pure cloud media workflow companies, but they're unable at the moment to do their um, assurance for the studios because there isn't that control set. So this addresses that. Keeping that control set updated with very low maintenance, because at the end of the day, uh, committees of volunteers never quite have enough time to do keep this up to up to speed. So if all we're looking at is the mapping, um, then you're in much better shape. Having a very um, you know, efficient operation so that you've got that very high frequency of that assurance and you know it's up to date with the, the latest threats. And making sure that the, the, the person who's paying for it at the top of the tree, the studio, the content owner, can see not just the audit report, but also the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, the, the dynamics of how people are doing their software control. They can look at incidents, they can see what the current remediations are. And hopefully this is, this is a lower cost way for, for those vendors in the, in the chain to establish security culture and be able to, to, to uh, work with the big studios on their content. So um, I, uh, I realize I've been um, talking, uh, talking at people for a while. Um, I don't know how many people we've got. We have a, a, a grand audience of six here on the, on the, on the, on the panel. So um, before I go on to the next steps, are there any questions that I can deal with? So a resounding silence, tumbleweed. So maybe let yeah. me talk. About... <laughs> so I mean, uh, is this is anyone here actually working in the media and entertainment industry? Doesn't sound like. But you're all consumers of it, so you all see content, and you've probably also seen pirate content. So you know you can understand the importance of this. So the next things I really wanted to talk about was um, uh, the you know what happens next. So. We've got the control mapping, and uh, as with anything on the Open Security Summit, there's a lot to do with graphing. So how do you do those relationships? And if you go and look at the summer control framework, some things like the security control framework, there's a lot of initiatives where people have done that mapping. So there are, there are mappings from a standard to other standards. So the intention for me is to, to take that and try and make take those name value pairs and try and use that to get some sort of um, network graph of uh, the control mapping because my experience was in taking the, the the current control mappings and flipping that around and trying to reverse them 
uh, was that there were great gaps. So I think it's, um, if you can take, get, uh, what I'm hoping to do is collaborate with Dennis and um, uh, others to, to, to create something that allows you to put any mappings into, from any control frameworks into this, and then look at the, the coverage and look at how these things map backwards and forwards. I guess the other thing to talk about is around um, the, the traditional risk heat maps. So again, I was just on a, 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 a session with Phil Huggins um, and Robin, and you know you get the traditional five by five matrix, which is you know red, green, amber. And I've seen so many of these risk matrices and people talking about high, low, medium risks. For me, those risks are useless unless they're quantified. You need to be able to say what the value of them is because uh, <clears throat> at the moment across any business outside of cybersecurity, you have other risks that people are dealing with. They're looking at the risk of, of uh, foreign exchange, the currency. So they will have a, an actual number that says if they don't hedge their foreign exchange and there's a change in the dollar, they could lose a lot of money. Um, people will, if you're in the financial services, you have to mark to market. You have to, at the end of the day, say, what are my assets worth? And there's a, there are big regulatory penalties if you don't do that. Um, so you have to quantify it. Uh, if you look at the... <clears throat> Insurance risks, you know, there is an actuarial table that says what's the insurance risk and you will pay for that insurance. So there's a very well established um, risk management philosophy across many other risks that that happen to businesses. Now, especially when you look at cloud businesses, they are uh, fundamentally exposed to cloud risks. And yet the way they they uh, look at those risks is in a very qualitative way, not quantitative way. So I think for me, there needs to be a, a quantification that says you treat a, a cyber risk in the same way as you treat other risks. They have a, an impact and a likelihood. The impact should be in dollar value and the likelihood should be a percentage. And if you can't, you know, some of these are very infrequent events, you, there's asymmetry of information. If you haven't got the information, then the executive team should discuss it, um, do some Monte Carlo simulation, do various things to come up with that quantified model and then go back and check and refine that model. For me, it's as key a skill as for the CFO to be looking at the financial hedging of uh, currency exchanges. I, again, I don't know how many people here were on the, the talk that Phil was giving, but um, I think there's another um, aspect of risk registers, which is they tend to be very static, uh, not quantified, but also um, they are, uh, they're not very well described. So they are there as a a doorstop they're there is saying yes we, we've got one um but they're not they're not practical living working documents so um in discussing this with phil you know i think there are three different uh, areas there's issues these are things that you just have to do uh, so you would not do anything without uh, you would not sit, stand up a system without having a, a web application firewall you wouldn't have a system without antivirus you wouldn't have a system without um, patching. These are just things that are hygiene. You just have to do those hygiene things. You don't even need to assess whether you need to do them. They're low cost enough and they're high impact enough. You should just do those. Then you've got a, a bunch of things that are risks and those risks you really need to consider quite carefully. And you need to do some analysis to say, is this a big risk? Is this a small risk? And you need to present those to the business in a way that they understand the risk and depending on their appetite and their resources that they they you know they do something about those risks so as with any pipeline as with any set of projects you'll have things that are near term and absolutely need uh, fixing high priority you know things that you really need to get around to at some stage some of those things keep on getting kicked down the road new priorities come in but you really need to treat that much more as a kind of project portfolio of risk and finally there are things that it's even not really even worth um doing the assessment of what you need to spend because you can't afford or it takes too much resource to be able to cover them. These are, these are grand events um, that you, uh, you, you, you're not going to be able to cover. And for those, what you actually have to do is have resilience, that there are going to be unexpected risks. There are things that, that are very major. And then you just need to have a very flexible organization. And that organization needs to be drilled as to what, um, what the response should be. So it's, uh, uh, again, I don't know if anyone here on the call has been involved in uh, kind of business continuity type exercises, but having that kind of stand up drill and then going through scenarios is the only way of getting a team ready to respond. 
to actually do real tests of, you know, I want to try and call Oleg. Is Oleg available on the phone to fix it? You know, um, uh, is Wallaby, uh, you know, is Wallaby's email up to date? All those sorts of things you don't find out unless you actually try doing those escalation chains. So I think the resilience is something that that will tie that risk register not into not just into something that compares well with the other financial risks in the business and cyber cyber should be a financial risk, but also into some of the operating procedures. So uh, just on the risk topic, any feedback, any questions, any comments? Not too many from that angle. I know at one point you were working on a uh, Excel spreadsheet for um, that actually kind of put together the uh, the yeah. different. I mean, the I, I mean, I, I think I showed it in the other session, but I've got a, a big yeah. spreadsheet that's got all those those risks. And at the end of the day, it's always a subjective um, judgment uh, by an expert to say which control maps to another. But really, that was a one-time exercise to clean up those uh, clean up the controls. But you know, just I mean, specifically, I think one of the other areas that is not well developed, um, uh, really, even in big organisations, is is how you get those risks surfaced and um, how they become current things that everyone looks at. But it's not just hidden in a risk specialist, um, you know, uh, spreadsheet. So the next thing I really wanted to talk about was around continuous audit, which is how do you make sure that you can check on things all the time. And um, again, I don't know what people's experience is here, but um, if I just take a, an audit process, a typical audit process, so there'll be a set of questions that go out uh, that are answered, and also we'll then review those questions, turn up, interview a few of the staff, maybe uh, log into a few systems and look, check a few firewall rules, walk around the building and look for exceptions. Um, so this is a kind of classic media uh, business audit that goes on. Um, and you know, it's probably a two, three, four day exercise, depending on the scale of the operation. Um, now, that's a one time exercise. So you'll tend to find that the, the normal cycle is that there'll be a month of effort preparing ahead of it. You'll go through the audit. There'll be a pre audit preparation by a consultant. You'll do the audit. You'll get your assurance to say you've passed. Everyone breathes a collective sigh of relief and does nothing for another uh, 11 months until the next cycle comes around. And when you're on the cloud, you really can't do that. You need to have some form of internal continuous uh, alerting that's going on. And you know, by segregation of duties, uh, these, are, these are some of the, the principles you should apply. Uh, people should be checking other people's work. So the best way I found of doing that is having a dashboard. So, if you're running tools, uh, uh, continuous uh, monitoring of these tools, and you're looking for alerts, I mean, there are some very sophisticated kind of um, options around here that try and automate this, to try and trigger and look for these changes. But quite often, in my experience, when you look at the, the complications involved in setting up and running those enterprise-grade enterprise tools, there's no way that smaller organizations could afford them or apply them. Uh, the level of expertise just to manage them is, is quite high. So. For me, it's more kind of getting a dashboard, uh, some sort of um, uh, control panel that shows you what's going on and then makes suggestions as what you can or can't do. And it's not to say that for large organizations, you can't, can't deploy some of these sophisticated tools, but I'm looking at something that, that brings the principle of, of looking at, of keeping stuff up to date much more to the fore. And then the last thing I wanted to really talk about was how this applies to other supply chains. So um, I've described in detail the media supply chain. It's something that I've worked in for the last 15 years. Previous to this, though, I was working in, in London market insurance and in retail and other supply chains. And I think that this approach probably has application for other supply chains as well. Uh, so that common mapping of uh, security uh, controls, um, trying to, because um, they all originate back at these, these, core, these core authorities, like the NIST, the NIST guidance at the bottom, but if, um, if anyone here has tried to read a NIST doc document, I know Wallaby, you would have done so, but they're pretty arcane. They're quite difficult to get your head around, even if you spend a lot of time looking at them. So uh, again, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think one of the things, the key things here from a business perspective is to make this stuff uh, understandable and approachable to non-security experts. 
Yeah, that can be a really complicated thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I I think it's uh it's difficult, and and um, I think the other thing here is around uh, risk is around feedback. So people make predictions. Um, uh, if you look in project management, people will predict a, an ROI for a certain um, outcome, and they say, look. We, we want to make this change and it's going to give us more revenue. It's going to reduce our headcount. It's going to mitigate a risk and the risk has this value. Very rarely do people go back and check. So I think having that continuous feedback loop uh, along with the audit, I think is something that's very valuable. But um, hope, I'm hoping that we can stand this up in a way that it's uh, approachable and usable without having to, to invest in um, uh, big enterprise tools and then setting them up. So let me just uh, dive in and show you a bit more of the background detail because I'm I'm uh, I can see here that we've uh, we've kind of got to the end of my presentation and there there isn't a huge amount of discussion. So what I've done here, if I just present it, and this is very much a manual representation of what I'm hoping is going to be a a, a proper graph. Um, I've taken these control blocks so if I let me just go back and show you if I go back into here's a control um, mapping template so this this is the the 1400 controls and you can see a level of detail within this which has got uh, a control and I'll just zoom in so you can see this you can actually read this so here's a control about continuous vulnerability management. And you can see here, that's a control uh, from a control schema. And then you can see here a, a custom control that's been written uh, that, that should be, uh, and, and people have made a stab at mapping those together. So this is the underlying mapping, but if you look right at the top level here, we've got here the pillar we're talking about, and then there's a control domain. So what I've done in creating this diagram here is to take the very highest level of those blocks and then try and group them together, cluster them together in a way that you can um, uh, uh, link them to each other. So you can see here, we've got organization of information security and um, information security policies out of ISO and governance and risk management from CSA. So, um, just by manually moving these blocks around, you can try and um, uh, create a, a high level abstraction. Obviously, what would be much better would be to do this programmatically with the, the kind of name value pairs that represent the graph, because then you can check your work, check other people's subjective <coughs> linking of these and then keep them up to date. So um, unless anyone has any um, more comments, I think I've probably exhaust, exhausted the, the subject matter. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, apologies for the late change. I was asked to change my talk. There were probably about 70 people coming to it originally. Uh, um, so you're, a, you're an elite audience that have come along. Um, has anyone got any more comments um, for the talk? Looks like uh, looks like we have someone trying to talk one more. Alana, are you uh, are you having a hard time hearing, or are you trying to speak? Well, let me see if we've got any chat okay. as well. I've got two chats. She was just having a. Oh yeah. Audio is stuck. Great. It's a technical fault. It's not the you're not asleep, Alona. Yeah, it's technology. Eh? Hey, um, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I mean, I don't see to be any honest, I mean, well, I think if if um, if there are no more comments, I'm going to give everyone back ten minutes in their day, and um, and then hopefully you can you can uh, come back to me through the GitHub, uh, talk to me through the forums, and we'll. Um, Look forward to working with you all on these uh, this control mapping. Awesome, yeah, thank you. Um, I definitely, I've been looking over at the uh, the Excel file. I haven't, I haven't made it into a CSV or anything. Um, I've been kind of busy too, but 
um, I've been looking it over and seeing, you know, what what could be done with it a bit. And I have a few ideas, so I, I'll probably uh, catch up with you there. On the Perfect. GitHub. Yeah, and no, I look forward. I mean, I think it's this is a collaborative effort. I think the principles of what I'm saying, you know, are universally applicable. It's getting the tools that help people automate it. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you. Great. Thanks, guys.